Okay, right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, webinar. Thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, I'm just going to make some introductory comments at the start before we get into the main business. Uh, my name is Neil Ward. I'm uh, based at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, and I'm one of the co-conveners of the AFN Network Plus. Uh, this is the first webinar uh, that we've organised under the auspices of the AFN Network Plus. Uh, it's a network that's funded by UKRI, which is the umbrella body for the British Research Councils, and it's to promote networking and interactions between scientists and researchers working in British universities and research institutes with practitioners and policymakers and stakeholder organisations uh, all around the topic of the UK agri-food system and the issues around the transition to a net zero UK by 2050. Uh, the Network Plus is funded for three years and runs until mid-2025. Uh, the activities of the network all involve uh, trying to promote interaction and sharing knowledge. Uh, we're also commissioning some small research projects uh, in, in the topic of agri-food and net zero, uh, and that's in 2023 and again in 2024, so two calls. We're car currently carrying out some future scenarios work uh, and we're holding an event in Leeds in April, which will be discussing some of the outcomes of that work and thinking about research priorities, both for network funding and also to help inform the research councils about where they should be um, prioritizing their, their investments in research on this topic. Um, Today is our first webinar, uh, and we plan to make these uh, a regular occurrence. We'll try and hold them usually on Fridays, maybe roughly monthly. Uh, we've had a good response to this one. Uh, and we're very pleased to have Dustin Benton with us today. Uh, Dustin's a policy director from the Green Alliance and is co-author of a recent report called Shaping UK Land Use Priorities for Food, Nature and Climate, which was published uh, in late January this year. So it's quite a recent report. Dustin's gonna speak for about 20, 25 minutes or so, and then we'll have plenty of times for uh, questions uh, afterwards. Please feel free to put your uh, questions in the chat and we will try and do our best to get through as many of, of them as we can um, before we finish and we'll finish at one o'clock uh, sharply. So thanks very much again for attending and Dustin over to you and hopefully you'll be able to share your screen. Great. Well, thank you all very much for uh, coming. I'm just going to fire up my slides. Um, I'm Basically, what I'm going to try to do is to answer this, this deceptively simple question. Uh, can we have all the things that we want from the land? Uh, and I'm going to give you a spoiler at the beginning. The answer is yes, uh, but. Uh, and most of the presentation is essentially about the but. The how do we do this? Uh, how do we get everything that we, we need from the land? Um, I'll, I'll give you a bit of context and big picture on, on nature and, and climate as it relates to the, to the UK's land system with a little bit of a discussion about our overseas land footprint in there. I'll, I'll do a very brief summary of the Skidmore review, uh, particularly its take on land and agriculture. Um, and I should say the review is more climate focused than nature, but uh, I think it's likely to be the framework through which most major land use decisions, at least in the next couple of years, will be taken because the carbon challenge is, is really acute for the land system. Um, obviously, it's a big report, 129 recommendations, so I'm not going to be able to do it proper justice, but I will uh, try to keep uh, to the main things. I'll then talk a bit about our recent report, Shipping UK Land Use. Uh, it, it's a scenarios report, so I'll talk through some of the scenarios. Um, looking, it basically looks at different ways that we can change the land system. It identifies some of the problems. I'll talk a bit some of, about some of the trade-offs that uh, any government will have to make, and indeed all the land managers and farmers in the UK will need to make over the next couple of years. And then I'll just touch at the end on a, a sort of what are the big challenges for the future. So, um, and then I think we've got uh, time for, for reasonably extensive Q&A, so I'm looking forward to your uh, difficult questions. Um, so <clears throat> to begin with, uh, what are what are our ambitions for land? I, I tried to be relatively strict here. There are there are more, but the big ones are obviously food production. That is the main way in which we use land today. There's a huge amount of cultural value um, that is associated with how we use our land, particularly uh, in countries in Europe. This is a, an incredibly important uh, political dynamic. We are increasingly asking for the land system to do carbon removal. It's an incredibly important part of uh, our future demands on land. Uh, habitat is obviously a, a big deal there. And 
in a sense, to do all of this, most of our land will have to be multifunctional. It will have to do more than one thing. But there are some trade-offs that determine how that multifunctionality actually works. Uh, our argument is that we'll need some specialization within this, some bundles of uses that fit together. Uh, and quite a lot of the presentation will explore how those bundles might fit together. I'll come back to this in a bit more detail later in the presentation. But first, let's start with uh, a bit of context. Uh, this is the context for nature. Um, it's a sad story, um, as any of you in the audience who have studied uh, the, the natural world uh, will, will know. It's sort of half a century of unremitting decline. I mean, obviously, there are, there are ups and downs in, in particular species, but the overall picture is pretty, um, pretty bad. Uh, against this, the British government has set uh, domestic goals to halt the decline of nature, to halt that decline that you see on the on the graph there by 2030, and to increase nature uh, by 10% by 2042. These are, on the one hand, very ambitious goals when you look at uh, the trend since 1970. On the other hand, um, I think it's fair to criticize some of the uh, ambition on nature uh, and perhaps to point out that the goals that we've signed up domestically are perhaps not entirely um, in keeping with the goals that we signed up to in COP15. Um, so just on the domestic front, increasing nature by 10% by 2042 would be meaningful. I mean, it would stop the trend, but it would restore 1% of the moths, 3% of butterflies, and 5% of the uh, bird abundance that we've lost since 1970. So if the anchor point in many people's minds is the kind of vision of the world prior to um, the kind of real takeover of the of the green revolution in a country like the UK, uh, 1970. We're not heading back to that on government goals. Uh, just on COP15, it is actually remarkably transformational in some of the some of the challenges that it sets, particularly the species abundance target. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily worked through to policy thinking yet. So Britain's domestic goal for for um, extinction risk it could be delivered, and I don't think the government will will do this, but could be delivered by simply shifting one species from, say, uh, you know, vulnerable to whatever the, the next step up in the in the ladder. In, in order to meet the COP15 goal, we think that you would need around five and a half thousand equivalent steps. So in practice, you would have to take all species that are at any level of extinction risk in the UK and get them to least concern. It really is a staggering change, that tenfold reduction in species risk. And I, I suspect that although it's not currently um, in policymakers' minds, this will come back and start to uh, raise the ambition, on, uh, on particularly on species abundance. The other big picture here is uh, carbon, uh, and I'm just sharing with you here a, 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 a partial cut uh, of some analysis which we'll be putting out next week on where the UK is uh, in its in meeting its carbon budgets. The analysis shown here covers the fifth carbon budget period, so it's 2028 to 2032. Um, and it's a traffic light analysis, so green is uh, the British government has policy that is in place which would be sufficient to meet uh, the fifth carbon budget. Um, the yellow is uh, there's some consultation on policy. The uh, amber color is government has said that it has an intention, it has an ambition to make some policy to deliver on the goals. And then the hashed red lines really are a, um, quite a sad state. Um, there, there's not even an ambition to, to meet carbon budgets. So um, this is three, I guess, important points is that this is pretty near term analysis, 2028 to 2032. Uh, the second thing is that the sectoral allocation, and I've, I've just put power, agriculture and land use and greenhouse gas removals, the actual, the full analysis uh, shows all sectors in the, in the UK economy. Um, it, it reflects the historic approach that the UK has taken to decarbonizing the power system first and leaving the land system to last or, or near last. So the goals that you see here aren't reflective of what we need to do to be net zero by 2050. They're reflective of what we would need to do by the fifth carbon budget period. So it's quite harsh on power because we are planning to mostly decarbonize the power sector by then. And it's a bit um, nicer on the land system that we're not expecting a great deal of decarbonization uh, there. Thirdly, it's reasonably generous. We don't assess policy effectiveness. So when, when the power sector is mostly rated green here, we're not saying we're highly confident that the power sector will be decarbonized. We're simply saying there is policy in place, which is sufficient if it is implemented fully um, and if the private sector delivers the infrastructure required. Um, to, to get there. The, the key thing that should come out of here is just how far behind the agriculture system is. So 
only 9% of where we need to be um, by the fifth carbon budget period has firm policy in agriculture. There's a big wadge, 40 odd percent, 41 percent, um, where there's a, a policy ambition, which is good, but that doesn't translate into anything without that ambition being translated into actual policy and then the policy actually being implemented. But the real shocker is the 50 percent of the of there where there just isn't a policy ambition at all. Um, this is new analysis, but I think I'll just come on to the Skidmore Review's um, take on agriculture and land. I think it is broadly reflective of where the Skidmore Review got to. So sorry, this is a slightly more boring slide just with words um, rather than a fancy graph. But I've tried to pull out the kind of key messages that the Skidmore Review um, brings out. The first, and I think that it is worth pointing this out, even though for experts in this space it might seem obvious, nature really is the net in net zero. Um, the land system in effect has to be carbon negative in order for the whole economy to be net zero. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily adequately recognized in the way in which analysis, particularly analysis that focuses on agriculture and land is done. Very often we separate out land and agriculture. Very often the assumption is that the land system just needs to get to zero, but in fact, you need to do more than zero in the land system. It's it's not quite unique, but, but almost unique. And I'll say a little bit more about this in a, in a second. The second big uh, message is that the government doesn't have a plan. Uh, I mean, our analysis uh, in, on the previous slide sort of confirms that uh, Chris Gidmore didn't have the benefit of that analysis, that analysis or at least our analysis when uh, he was writing his report, but he, he got it bang on uh, and he said it out loud. There isn't a plan and it's a problem. Um, the third key point is that ELM, which you would expect to be the major delivery mechanism, uh, isn't enabling private investment in land decarbonization, and it's not enabling it from either from farmers and land managers or from uh, the corporate world, uh, in particular food system actors. And that's in part because of the fourth challenge, which is that there aren't really agreed carbon metrics uh, for the food system. So if you speak, as I do, to, to food businesses, and as Chris Skidmore did to food businesses, they'll say, well, yeah, we're still in kind of metrics land where we're not quite sure how much of our scope three footprint we can really count on, whether the tools that we're using are, are commensurate with, with other companies, so that when they're thinking about decarbonizing, it's not necessarily the case that it's all going to work. And that echoes some of the um, points made in the um, independent national food strategy. Uh, fifth point is governance, um, and this again is something that um, has changed very recently. Um, there's a huge split, so we, the DEFRA holds many of the levers and part of the problem, but other levers and other parts of the picture are held by Desnes, uh, previously Bayes, DLUC, and uh, uh, DBAT, as my colleagues are calling it, which is the Trade Department, I had to relook at my, my acronyms, um, which has a huge effect. In fact, the trade deals have a huge effect in practice on how the UK's land system will operate because um, they help, it, trade deals help to set the context in which farmers are able to sell their produce. Um, the governance is a problem. Chris Skidmore uh, solves that through his Office for Net Zero Delivery. It includes some of the recommendations that we have made on an Office for Carbon Removal, which would be specifically focused on the carbon removals market. Uh, and there's an awful lot of opportunity in, in getting that right. Uh, final one, and this is where uh, the Skidmore Review places a lot of its hopes, is in a land use framework. Um, a land use framework that manages the trade-offs in the food system. Um, in particular, it calls for uh, a very fine-grained spatial land use framework with some element of directionality, and that echoes the national food strategy and it echoes the kind of work that we've done. Um, and I will come back onto uh, some of this in a bit more detail in a second. I think overall, it's a, it's a wake-up call for the agriculture and land sector, and it's not an overdue wake-up call. Um, I guess the question that it raises is how do you solve that challenge beyond the land use framework, solving the land governance problem, getting the metrics right, getting ELM right? Uh, well, um, I, I'm going to start to try to answer that problem through the prism of the trade-offs that we see in the land system. Um, because our model shaping UK land use uh, and, and the report associated with it explores those trade-offs and explores how we might uh, adjudicate between different priorities we have for the land system. The first trade-off is between food and nature. Um, so this graph uh, essentially shows the abundance of uh, 116 wild bird species. We're using these as a proxy for nature because 
uh, this is the best data set that we have available. Um, ideally, we would have data on mammals and insects. It's just not available. This is a combination of both wild species, i.e. species that flourish principally on non-farm habitats and farm adapted species. So it's a, it's a very broad index and it's it's a national index, uh, which is incredibly helpful when you're thinking about different sorts of habitat types. What it shows in very broad terms is that land that is conventionally farmed is really not very good for nature. Land that is farmed in a low yield way, so there are many terms for this and the terms can be a bit fluid, but think agroecology, think regenerative agriculture, think nature-friendly farming, very substantially better for nature than conventional farming. But the uh, really big deliverer for the natural world is um, semi-natural habitat, you know, land that is deliberately designed for species. And you can see the species abundance on average uh, in those three sort of buckets there. So there are trade-offs with how much nature we want and how much food we're seeking to grow on any particular parcel of land. The second major trade-off is with carbon. In order to meet our overall net uh, zero goals, the land system as a whole has to be carbon negative. I'll come on, I'll explain that a bit further in a second. But um, the reality is that most land uses that grow food mean that the land releases rather than stores carbon. And that's in contrast to natural habitats like woodland or scrub, which tend to be good at removing carbon from the atmosphere. Grassland can also be um, good at this. Um, and the I, I just pulled out the peat question here because there is absolutely staggeringly large amounts of carbon being released from peatland um, agriculture, particularly lowland peat, uh, which is the majority of, of peatland emissions, certainly in England, and I believe also in the UK. So you have this challenge between land that you're managing mostly for food production and land that you would ideally want to manage for carbon. Um, and the point is we will have to manage these trade-offs. We can get some element of multifunctionality to blunt the trade-offs, but we have to reckon with them um, if we're to come up with a nature positive, carbon negative land system. So I'll just say a little bit here about why the land system as a whole needs to be carbon negative, because I think it's counterintuitive. Certainly when I speak to agricultural policymakers, um, it's not something that is, has been at the top of their uh, thinking. This chart shows residual emissions across the economy by 2050. It's based on the Committee on Climate Change's balanced net zero pathway. So these are the emissions that we don't get to zero. And therefore, they are the reason why we have to have negative emissions if negative emissions, the net in net zero to offset. The, the key takeaways here is that half of the removals that we will require by 2015 come from the land system itself. They're mostly livestock related. So in a way, if you think about it, these ought to be thought of as internal to the land system. We, we don't do that for accounting reasons, which are, are sensible and good, but it's helpful to think about where these residual emissions are coming from. Aviation is the next big chunk, roughly a quarter of uh, all of the residual emissions in 2050 come from aviation. And there's an interesting question about whether the, the justice and financial implications of saying we're asking the land system, farmers and land managers, to create offsets for an aviation industry. Or if I wanted to be a little bit more controversial, I might say there perhaps is a trade-off between the frequency with which you eat hamburgers uh, and the frequency with which you fly. And obviously, hamburger eaters and frequent flyers are not always the same people. So there's some interesting questions which we're going to get to, I suppose, in due course. The other bits are um, a whole mix of sectors, mostly land for methane, and then little bits of F gases, unanticipated, or sorry, anticipated uncaptured emissions from carbon capture and storage. But I think the, the myth that we are using the land system to sequester basically emissions from heavy industry isn't really the case. We're mostly using the land system to sequester emissions that come from the land system itself and from aviation. So that then leads you to the kind of strategic response. How does this look in the round? Well, you've got your land system emissions, and I should say this is a schematic graphic, not a, you know, don't, don't try to read the bars and, and size things accurately because it changes depending upon your scenario. But in broad terms, we've got the emissions from the land system as a whole, and you can change those in, in broadly four ways. You can cut the size of that blue bar um, down, reduce the total residual emissions. You can um, you can do that through farming and diet change. You can grow more trees, you can restore more peat, you can try to sequester carbon in soils, uh, so you use nature-based sinks. And then you can do two forms of uh, direct air capture, uh, removing carbon from the atmosphere and storing it in some way. The first is BEX, biomass energy with carbon capture and storage. You grow some 
plant material, you burn it somewhere, you take the emissions, you shove them under the North Sea, store them for a long time, or you can cut out the natural world and just do that using electricity through ducts, directly capturing the carbon dioxide um, molecules, stripping off the oxygen, shoving the, the uh, carbon into the ground. Um, the, at, at present, um, the big question with DAX is, will it come down in cost and will it be scalable? At the moment, it's very energy intensive. There is a future potential competition between BEX and DAX, uh, which I think there's probably not enough data to say anything intelligently about. We have assumed the CCC's kind of assumptions on DAX and all of our potential stuff to around five gigawatts, I think, by 2050. So that then brings me to the report that we uh, launched in January, Shaping UK Land Use. Uh, it looks at six scenarios uh, which explore different ways of managing land. Uh, it's trying to meet a range of, of goals. All of the scenarios meet the carbon budgets and achieve net zero. That was the, uh, the de minimis requirement for any scenario to qualify. They all attempt to meet our, our nature targets, um, but not all of them succeed. All of them maintain today's share of UK versus overseas food production. So we have a no offshoring of food production assumption in all the scenarios. Some of them change that some of them increase the UK's food self-sufficiency rate. And all of them at least maintain today's farm incomes, some improve farm incomes. So to give you a sense of what are the what are the boundaries on this, they vary how we use land what we eat, our diets, um, how we use public money and the amount of public money that we put into the land system, and the balance of where we get removals from, from nature-based across different sorts of um, engineered removals. They do this to expose the trade-offs that are in the system and to expose some of the choices that we're going to have to make, whether we like it or not, between now and 2050. Um, they're all UK in scope, but I should say, obviously, the policy tools that would be used to make any of these changes are devolved, and that definitely does matter. Uh, I won't dive too much into detail in the question of England, Scotland, Wales, etc., but happy to pick up on that in the questions. So hopefully you're all still with me. I'm going to start to get into the really wonky detail uh, for you all. These are ta-da, the five different scenarios. Um, they are, this is essentially showing you how land use will change. The bars are different sorts of land use. There are, are four categories of land use we're showing here. Um, the, um, the purple is high yield farming. So that's basically what we do with farmland today. And I should say this is just farmed land. So this is 72% of the UK. We haven't made any assumptions about the other bits of land uh, that are in the system. The underlying model does account for population growth, I should say, for anyone who is interested in that. Uh, the light green is low yield farming. So this is agroecological or regenerative or wildlife friendly. Essentially, it is making space on farms for nature and accepting a small yield penalty in order to do that. Uh, the dark green is habitat creation. So this is one where food production is very limited on land. Um, and instead, the goal is principally nature and carbon. There is a little bit of, uh, of multifunctionality in some sorts of natural habitat creation. You can graze on species rich wildlife meadows, for example. In fact, it's quite a good management technique. But the goal is not principally to use the land for food. And then we've got um, bioenergy crops in, in one of the scenarios. So what you can see is that there's quite a big difference across the six scenarios, which I would just briefly describe for you now. We have the agroecology everywhere scenario, which is the first one, and that essentially sees all existing farmland replaced with wildlife friendly, agroecological, lower yield, much better for nature type of farming. The second scenario is the business as usual scenario. It continues farming as, as today. It includes some expected yield improvements. It's not quite the same as the government's sort of default, but actually it's very difficult to work that out. It's part of the reason why the government lost the net zero strategy court case. But uh, the key thing that it does is it holds diets as they are today. It says no one will change how they eat over the next 40 years. Um, we're just going to stick with what we, what we do now. Um, the self-sufficiency scenario is a, a food security autarky. It's a sort of U-boat scenario. Imagine Britain is cut off from the world. We have to feed ourselves. We have to find the energy that we need from our land system, and we don't trade um, anything. Actually, technically, the model does allow for trade, so we can have pineapples and bananas, uh, and we export the equivalent, but uh, we are 100% uh, sort of food self-sufficient and uh, energy self-sufficient in that scenario, uh, and it varies diet in order to achieve that principally. 
The no engineered greenhouse gas removal scenario is a, a sort of real zero scenario. That is to say, it, it excludes all BECs and DACs. And it says, we're going to meet our carbon budgets. We're going to feed the country. Um, and we're going to do that without any of these engineered greenhouse gas removals. And to do that, it deploys a very large amount of some natural habitat creation. We uh, restores everything it possibly can, consistent with some food production. Uh, and then the balance scenario is our preferred scenario where we, we try to mix the different uh, priorities in a, in a relatively sensible way. Um, I won't read through the kind of numbers on the bottom, but what they hopefully begin to give you a sense of is firstly that there's an awful lot of diet change that ends up shifting around in order to make things work. Uh, the other thing to point out is that the first three scenarios are essentially either fully land sparing or fully land sharing type scenarios. So there, there is, they take one of those two approaches. So business as usual is a, um, in, in principle anyway, a land sparing scenario, scenario, except there's no room to spare any land because uh, we don't change our diet. The agriculture everywhere is a 100% land sharing scenario. So all land becomes food and some element of, of nature. Uh, whereas the, um, the self-sufficiency of the no-engineered greenhouse gas removal and the balanced priorities are three compartment type scenarios. So these are ones where there are some element of land that is principally focused on food production, although it needs to be food production in a more environmentally friendly way. There's some land that is still focused on food production, but trades yield in exchange for much more nature and sometimes reduced emissions. And then there's some land that's principally focused on nature and carbon and um, mostly um, issues food production it can be a bit but that's that's not its priority um and we i think one of the interesting things that our modeling does which others haven't done is to model land use overseas so you can see that the business as usual, as usual scenario sees overseas land use increase very significantly and a lot of that is for biomass imports to be used for becks so we think that uh, if we keep things the same, then uh, we'll need three whales worth of somebody else's land to grow bioenergy in order to feed into British Bex plants in order to offset the emissions from the residual bits of the economy. Uh, I'll briefly show you some of the implications for nature. So across these scenarios, as I said, they, we all we, we're always trying to get as much nature as possible. We're always trying to achieve two government, the big government goals: the ending nature declines by 2030 goal, and the increasing nature by 2050 by at least 10 percent. Business as usual and self sufficiency, because they're focused either on retaining our existing diets or on uh, maximizing caloric production within the UK in order that we have no imports, fail to achieve both nature goals. We we just there just isn't enough space to um, eat the way we do today or to grow all of our food within the UK's territorial boundaries and achieve the nature goals. The other scenarios achieve the nature goals, although interestingly, the three compartment type approaches are much better for nature by 2050 than a pure land uh, sharing model. Um, so there, there, there begins to expose some of the trade-offs. The other thing that we've done, which is we think novel and I hope interesting, is to begin to quantify the costs of doing this. So um, we are assuming a public money for public goods type of payment framework underpinning the future. This is inspired by England's model, but we can see elements of this uh, certainly in, in Scottish and Welsh policy. And to that land management type payments, we've also considered the cost of needing to support BECs or DACs. Uh, again, the idea is we're internalizing the costs uh, of both the energy choices and the food, land, nature, um, land-based carbon choices into the same system. So the big picture here is that um, those scenarios that uh, keep farming broadly the same way that we do today and which keep um, diets the way they are today spend an awful lot of money on BECs. Um, they do that in order to sequester the emissions which continue to arise from not changing the way in which we manage our land. <clears throat> the no engineered uh, remove, greenhouse gas removals and the balanced priority scenario spend much less or deep none on engineered removals. Um, instead, they pay UK farmers to change how they use land in order to um, get that natural carbon sequestration and indeed to reduce the, the total um, the total emissions that come out of the land system, full stop. 
I should say we we have made some value judgments here, some social value judgments here, principally to do with farm incomes. As I said, we we will always we always maintain at least today's farm incomes, and because. Uh, only about a quarter of British farms actually make a profit from food production. 75% of farms either make profit from um, existing cap payments or, or in the future, uh, ELM payments in England, the equivalents in uh, devolved governments, or from so-called diversification income. So glamping tents, business units, wedding hire, that kind of thing. Uh, we have essentially guaranteed rural incomes and where the activities that are taken in 2050 don't maintain incomes we just give a farm income top up that's that's available in yellow i should say in both the no engineer ggr and the balanced priority scenario because this is a total cost from now to 2050 actually by 2050 you don't need that farm income top up the payments for nature and carbon are sufficient to support all farmers on at least today's um, incomes and in our balanced priority scenario um, two thirds of farmers are better off economically as a result of switching from a cap type model to a payments for nature and carbon. So in summary, uh, because the land system needs to be net negative <coughs> and because we want to restore nature, there's sort of three things that come out of this type of analysis. Uh, the first is that recompartment type approaches seem to make everything easier. Um, payments for wildlife friendly expand in those scenarios, but the big wins come from combining both sparing and sharing together. They're much more cost effective and much better for nature than if you try to do either on their own. Uh, the second, and I think this is really important for uh, the politics of this, is that paying UK farmers to store carbon in UK land is both cheaper in absolute terms and sees the majority of the public money that's spent in these systems going to UK farmers. Beck's dominated scenarios tend to export a large amount of money overseas to pay other people to manage their land for bioenergy crops or forestry or what have you in order to buy into them. Um, pay uh, for as feedstocks for, for Beck's plants. Uh, and the third big scenario that comes out is certainly on the nature side of things, diet change basically is essential. Um, it, it doesn't seem like we can square the circle of the land system without some element of, of diet change. And the, um, the business as usual scenario really pulls that out. We can brute force our way to a net zero system in carbon terms, but we don't think we can also get nature without some element of dietary shift. So last comment from me then, as I know we're uh, nearly out of time, I guess the key levers and challenges which I want to bring out are that uh, we absolutely must have a spatially explicit land use framework, one that takes multifunctionality as the default, but is explicit about the trade-off. So we cannot on every parcel of land do maximize nature, maximize carbon removal, maximize food production, maximize culture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We will have to bundle these things together and three compartment is our approach to doing that. Um, the second is that because the land use framework will essentially just be a statement of intent, an information tool, it, it doesn't have in itself any means of binding the real decision makers in the land system who are principally farmers and land managers. The environmental land management scheme in England and the equivalent schemes elsewhere have to use the money that the public is making available in line with the logic of the land use framework. Uh, that's the tool that will actually enable farmers and land managers to shift how they use land in order to achieve all these goals. The third big thing to pull out is just the sheer scale of change. In our balanced scenario, we change two and a half percent of land per year out to 2050. That's principally changing from conventional agriculture to either low yield agroecological type farming or to semi natural habitat um, creation. And just to give you some numbers to land how very significant that scale of change is, that by 2050, and these are cumulative, not annual figures, if I wanted to get all the onshore wind I needed, um, I would need 1.3% of the land. If I wanted all the solar I needed and I was committed to doing it as ground mount solar, I'd need 1% of the land. Right, that's land in England, that figure. If I wanted all the housing for an 80 million people population, which is what the ONS says the UK will have by 2080, I need 1.8% of land. So you have to change more land than all of that by 2050 in its use every year in order to achieve the kind of change here. Again, in order to make that possible, we've assumed no tenure change. So no farmer loses their land. They're always on the land and making a good income from the land. But this kind of shape of change is going to be big. 
The other big player here is alternative proteins. We, we see them as the sort of renewables of the food system. And we think, certainly in our balanced scenario, that they can replace most of the processed meat consumption uh, in the country today by 2050. Um, we think this because the technology is pretty promising, um, likely to be much cheaper. And we observe that sausages and um, you know burgers and whatnot are tasty. People like them. Uh, it's healthier to eat lentils and vegetables. But, um, you know, if we were all uh, rational in what we ate, uh, we would all be incredibly long lived and super fit. And uh, certainly speaking personally, I don't live up to my own aspirations. So alternative proteins feel like an important part of that transition. And then the final thing I'll just land on is that all of this that I've uh, sort of described to you today is all kind of logical and rational. It's all driven by numbers. It's all ultimately the model is that we've used is fundamentally sort of cost and, and systems optimizing. But the reality is that this kind of change in land use will depend on people taking pride in doing things differently. Farmers, for the most part, particularly the 75% of farmers that aren't making a profit from food production, don't do it because they're economically rational, cost optimizing, uh, you know, units who think, right, I'm going to do the best thing I can, make the highest income, etc. They're doing it for lots of complicated reasons, many of which are to do with pride and place and character. And we need to imbue that sense of pride, place and character in using the land somewhat differently than we do today. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. On that note, uh, I'm going to stop. Thank you all very much for the time. And I uh, am now going to look at chat and uh, Q&A, but uh, back over to you, Neil. Great, thanks very much, Dustin. You covered a, an awful lot of ground there, but very succinctly and um, really profound implications for your analysis. I was doing a bit of work with my students this morning um, on the various scenarios that are being produced by different organizations from the, um, the NFU plan in 2019 through Climate Change Committee and the National Food Strategy, Sustainable Food Trust, we've got your set. Um, there's the work going on for um, DEFRA and DESNES at the moment, and they've got another 11. We counted 27 scenarios in circulation, um, but you've got your preferred one. Um, and uh, we've got quite a lot of comments and questions in the chat, and there are two or three questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, I think uh, Clive's question in the Q&A was about thinking about all land together and a comment on the carbon, uh, the, the greenhouse gas emissions numbers that he thought looked a bit low. I, I think you might have picked up on the point about treating all land together and um, the risks of sort of hiving off land use and land use change and treating it separately from agriculture. But um, I don't know whether you might want to say a little bit more on, on, on that, that issue of um, the value of thinking about all the land holistically, even though we might have to account for our emissions in the national inventory in a compartmentalized way. So I'll try to answer this, but um, Clive, please uh, send me a message or something like that if you, if you want more methodological detail. I can join my, my co-author, uh, Lydia Collis, who's the real expert on this. Essentially, what we've tried to do is to treat agricultural emissions and land use emissions in the same big bucket um, because they're interrelated. We understand that they're accounted for separately. That makes a lot of sense. But um, we've tried to bundle them together. And we've also bundled biomass in it. So we've given the accounting credit for the negative emissions that a Beck a Bex plant generates to the biomass, which is generated in the land system, which is dodgy from a kind of greenhouse gases emissions formal framework, but we thought it was useful in order to display how the land system fundamentally is the driver of these things. If you have a Bex plant without a biomass input, you don't have a negative emissions. So we've accounted for it that way in thinking about how the land system needs to operate. I hope that answers the question. I'm, I think we may have lost Neil. In his absence, I might. Uh... Coming back. Okay. <laughs> oh, there you are. We lost uh, so I got kicked off the internet, so that might mean I've lost the chat. Um, so if you look through the chat, there's a whole host of nice questions. Jess, can you see them and pass them on to Dustin? Yeah, Dustin, there were, there were quite a few questions around um, food waste and whether this was something that you'd factored in, given that I think we waste about a third of our of our food. How, how has that um, kind of been built in or not to the models? 
the model does include food waste reduction. Um, from memory, I can't remember the factor it, it uses. I think it's the balance net zero, the CCC's balance net zero pathway of a halving of food waste by 2050. Um, we include that, it's really important. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure that it's 50%. There's one scenario that the CCC has where it's a 70% reduction, which feels to me like you're touching on the edge of the technically possible, but I don't think that our model assumes that. The, there's also, Neil, I don't know if you can see these still, but um, there's also a, a couple of questions um, related to the role of ruminants in the um, in rotation and their importance in terms of reducing artificial nitrogen fertilizer. Because if, if we're, like you said, if we're moving more towards, um, uh, you know, alternative proteins, how do we how do we deal with the with the need for rotation and livestock in the rotation potentially? So to be clear, this is absolutely not a vegan scenario. There's still a lot of livestock in, in the system. We reduce uh, meat and dairy by 45% in the preferred scenario. We think that that will mainly be processed meat and dairy. And the appeal from a kind of rotational regenerative kind of agriculture perspective is that intent chicken nuggets, um, burgers, all that kind of stuff tends to be the product of uh, large scale industrial agriculture. So not the kind of agriculture that does that nutrient cycling type stuff. Uh, we haven't done the deep, uh, we, we don't have a kind of underlying nitrogen model, for example, in this. So we haven't done the deep detail of is this, um, you know, does it all stack up? Um, so there, although the agroecology scenario that we model does have that underlying um, system and it uh, has a higher meat reduction than we assume in the balanced net zero or in the balanced pathway that we've put together. So I'm at least in at high level, I'm relatively confident you could make an argument about the composition of different types of meat or whatever. But I think for this type of analysis, it's it's probably okay. I should say in our in our preferred scenario, um, the majority of land is farmed in that low input, lower yield sort of manner, and so could potentially have ruminants as part of a, a rotation. And we've accounted for the emissions that arise from doing that. Neil, can you see the questions at all still? No, I can't. I can't see them anymore. But there were, I could see the second I've, one in the Q and A. Uh, I've got a few is, queued up. Um, if that yeah. if that's helpful, because I when, when yeah. you disappeared, Neil, I started pressing buttons madly. <laughs> uh, there, there is a question about uh, reduction in meat and dairy consumption and whether that changes calories. The, the answer is we we account for calories. We maintain um, calorie consumption at roughly today's levels. Uh, so probably more than we need from a health perspective. Uh, and we do that by substituting up resources. Again, in our preferred scenario, it is a um, alternative proteins led approach. Within the model, there is plenty of flexibility for the types of protein con consistent with the levels of meat reduction, but there's plenty of space for protein crops, for lentils, peas, uh, chickpeas, et cetera, if, if you would like to. Uh, we aren't super specific on the dietary choices, but in aggregate, um, at least at that macronutrient level, uh, things are absolutely fine. Uh, there's another question about climate risks and vulnerabilities. Um, and this is a flaw in the modeling that we've done. We don't have, so there, there's a kind of semi-spatial logic within it. So we, we know about uh, areas of uh, upland and lowland peak within the model, and it treats them differently because they're different in both emissions and in habitat type uh, things. We know about heathland and um, species-rich grassland and those sorts of habitats. What we don't know is physically where they are in the country. So it's not a GIS model, but it does have a, an element of, of spatial uh, character to it. On the sort of, so that means that we can't model, for example, if the east of England gets super, super arid and therefore becomes incredibly <laughs> for, for um, arable farming, we can't account for that, nor can we account for the kind of terrifying scenarios I've seen coming out of the University of Exeter about the shutdown of the Fermi Halian cycle and the total loss of, of sort of food uh, production, or I think it's a an IT odd percent loss of food production capacity in the UK. Uh, we unfortunately can't model for that. Uh, what we have done, we're not quite as punchy on the high yielding systems as the CCC is. So there's a there's a little bit of, uh, you know, you might argue that some of the most sort of sustainable intensification type scenarios are very um, optimistic about future climate conditions enabling continued yield growth. We're a little bit off that. Um, we're a bit more optimistic on agroecological yields rising over time. And that's principally because when we spoke to uh, a bunch of researchers on this, they basically said, we haven't really tried selective breeding. We haven't really tried to optimize uh, inputs in a quasi-organic type approach. So there ought to be more space for improvements there, particularly if you envisage things like small farm robots and essentially allowing 
some machinery to do the type of very intensive manual labor that the most highly productive agroecological systems, which are basically tiny smallholder farms, principally in the developing world, do. Um, we we'll probably won't get there because humans seem to be best at doing that incredibly detail-focused work, but we think that mechanization can partially resolve that. Um, so other I, things I, I, yes. I was going to say, Dustin, I've got a question just following on from what, what you're talking about. Um, what are your thoughts? I'm guessing this is not being part of the um, the report, but what are your thoughts on um, what needs to happen? What are the kind of mechanisms that need to happen to enable some of these different scenarios to actually um, to actually materialize? Because, um, for example, the agroecology model that would probably assume a lot of more like localized a uh, localized food system, localized processing for for food, that kind of thing. Just sort of wondering what what is the infrastructure that needs to be in place to allow some of some of these? It's a really big question, and it depends on the different scenarios um, as, as to what you would need. I think that the top of the list for me is recognition of the scale of change. I just don't have a sense that we are currently thinking through how much change will need to occur. And again, when I say change, what I don't mean is people being turfed off their land. I don't mean farmers losing their, their ability to, to earn an income, none of that. I, I think we just take that off the table as, uh, as an option. Instead, it's how we use the land and some of the physical character of that land. We are going to see big change. I think that change could be really, really wonderful. But at the moment, when I speak to politicians and even when I speak to some of the activists in this space, we are essentially assuming that the future land system will look basically the way that it does today, even though the land system today doesn't look like the way it did in the 1970s. I'm, I'm not old enough to remember, but when I speak to um, my older colleagues, they say, well, actually, things do look quite a lot different, and particularly the kind of uh, you know obsession with tidiness of, of farms. This is something that comes out from some of the older farmers I, I speak to. We, we need to start setting expectations for significant difference. We did that in the energy system. We said, we are not going to be running a system that is dominated by coal, centralized coal and gas power stations. That's not the future. We're going to have a much more diverse, much more renewably led sort of system. And that helped to shape the expectations of investors um, in the system. The challenge with the land system is that crudely, when I started working on um, energy policy, you could basically get like 10 people in a room who were the real key decision makers and say, right, guys, and it was mostly guys at that point, this is what we're going to do, and there was an agreement. You can't do that with the land system. You've got 100,000 farmers, you've got literally millions of people who are employed in the wider food system, all of whom have a stake and an interest, and that's before we get to the fact that, bluntly, people are, care a huge amount about what the land looks like and how it feels like and what the local economy looks like in their area near them. So this is... I, I, my top point is uh, we, we need some democratic discussion based on uh, on a real uh, view on, on what change looks like. Beyond that, there are a whole bunch of policy mechanisms. I'm relatively optimistic that an essentially incentives-led approach, the likes of uh, England's ELM, could get you an, an awful, awfully long way. We need a lot of trust in that system, and we also need the sense that if farmers choose to do things differently, if, if the ideal isn't the biggest, fluffiest sheep uh, as the kind of the source of pride, that needs to shift towards beauty, towards nature, towards carbon removal. If we can do that, then we've got uh, a lot of the way that we need to go. Can I just take you to a, a question from um, India Langley, which I think is just ties into what you've been saying, which I think is really important, is... Um, how does this all tie into the social impacts of reducing meat and dairy and who has access to it i guess because if we're talking about reducing um reducing livestock and i, I guess it's it's less but better meat isn't it in in that sort of system um are we looking at it becoming more expensive and what does that mean for accessibility nutrition etc cetera, etc cetera? So we haven't modeled food prices within these scenarios. I can give you directional information, particularly based on work that I did when I was at the National Food Strategy. Um, what we know is that um, agroecological vegetable and essentially plant-based foods, the actual production cost 
isn't likely to be uh, more expensive. Yields will be lower, so they'll be less available if you if you switch to that system. But the, the costs of production are, are are not very different from conventional agriculture. Um, that's not the case in animal based foods. They're all more expensive, uh, and that's in part because. Um, agroecological production systems tend to insist on um, essentially animal welfare type measures. Uh, so you get fewer cows, pigs, sheep, whatever, chickens per unit area. Um, and you also tend to get less um, grain fed meat. And like it or not, grain fed meat is efficient in the kind of calories in, calories out, land use sort of, uh, sort of sense. So in this scenario, uh, well, in our preferred scenario, we think that alternative proteins will be cheaper than today, principally replacing processed meats. Most likely, if we're to switch to a more agroecological production system, those the cost of rearing those will be more expensive. What we don't know, because we haven't done the sums yet, is whether the additional value that farmers would get from nature and carbon payments offsets those into what that would do to the market price. Uh, there are major social equity questions that arise in this. I would say, however, on average, and obviously there are edge cases everywhere, on average, British people get double the amount of protein they need for a healthy diet. Unlike in many other countries, particularly in the global south, uh, British people don't need as much animal protein as we eat today just in order to be healthy. So there is a possibility there for people who um, don't want to or can't afford pot meat. Yeah, okay. Dustin, you're doing a great job of rattling through these questions, but I don't think that they're building up. I don't think we will get through them all today uh, if we're going to finish on time. Um, I can see there's one from Sarah Bridal in the chat. Did you see that one about have you thought about the sort of resilience of the scenarios to possible food system disruption? Oh, gosh. Uh, so beyond the kind of climate question, which I think I, or climate adaptation question, which I, I picked up earlier, um, resilience, I think you have to start from thinking about what, what do you consider resilient? So the, the foods, the sort of self-sufficient scenario uh, would be resilient to, uh, you know, the U-boats rising from the depths again and blockading Britain. That would be the most resilient scenario. It would not be resilient to a UK specific climate problem. So, you know, a particularly cold winter or dry summer or something like that. That's where trade tends to, to bail you out. In general, though, scenarios that rely on less meat uh, don't force you to kind of max out the system as much as higher meat scenarios. So you have the natural resilience within that. I've heard um, arguments, I haven't seen the data on this, that um, lower input, lower output, more agroecological type of farming systems are more resilient because you're um, not stressing the whole system to maximize food production. To be honest, I think that, that there's a, a reasonable debate to be had there. I've spoken to many very nature-friendly farmers who would say a tiny bit of synthetic nitrogen actually goes quite a long way to improving your, at least your financial resilience, um, not at the levels that, that we apply uh, today. So those are, those are some, some thoughts, but um, I guess the other point is that part of resilience is about a healthy natural environment. And that, so those scenarios that increase the abundance of nature ought to also increase the resilience of the system. Um, from a food production uh, perspective, a lot of that is about soil health rather than sort of wild species. So I don't want to over egg it, but in general, more nature is likely to lead you to a more resilient system. Great, thanks. I don't know if you can see the one from Gary Stevenson in the in the chat, um, which is about processed meats, ruminants, and I think ends up with the GWP20 or GWP100 on the methane question. Um, is there anything you, you could say in response to the question about um, how to measure methane and, uh, and all of that? So we're, we're using GWP100. Um, th that's because we're, we're thinking about kind of carbon budgets and that's the, the standard metric. Um, the, the GWP20, GWP100, GWP star kind of debate, a, a lot of that depends on whether you're thinking about sort of 2050 as a time slice or whether you're thinking about the dynamics of the climate system and trying to avoid peak warming. Um, my observation is that in general, if you're trying to deal with peak warming, you want to reduce the ruminant um, emissions much more rapidly um, than uh, than in ones where you're talking about sort of GWP 100. Uh, we haven't done that kind of ultra detailed peak warming type scenario. We've just optimized for uh, the UK's legal carbon targets. 
Um, and just on the processed uh, meats question, uh, yes, processed meats to a certain extent use up the bits that we don't like to eat. Um, I think that the we're confident that that kind of comes out and wash. Um, the, the reality is there will be some diet change in there that isn't about processed meat. Uh, we have been incredibly pessimistic about alternative proteins. We basically said they will never, even by 2050, ever be able to substitute for a kind of, uh, you know, a chicken drumstick or, or you know, a, a flank steak or something like that, uh, which is probably pessimistic. So when you think about carcass balance and all of that, um, I think it's it's probably not a problem for this level of analysis. We're coming up to time. I can see a really juicy question in there from David Baldock um, about um, a key driver is agricultural commodity prices. Um, and if we're going to move to some sort of land use logic um, in the face of quite a strong driver around sort of food commodity prices, then um, what, what, what are we to do? How do we achieve a faster pace of land use change? Uh, leave it to David to ask, to ask me the easy questions. Um, I guess my uh, my immediate reply would be that commodity prices matter an awful lot for arable farmers, and they tend to be the profitable farmers. They obviously matter a lot as an input into most uh, livestock farmers. Um, most animals in Britain, even cows, are fed supplementary um, supplementary feed. Um, we uh, you, the the kind of the model relies on the academic work of my co-author, Lydia Collis. She did a bunch of testing analysis about what farmers are willing to accept in order to change practice. And that is the basis on which the, we've assumed payment. So I, I think that the, uh, the payment rates we assume within the model via ELM or a similar sort of mechanism in other parts of the UK, in principle, ought to be sufficient to lead to those changes. Obviously, farmers need to believe that those are th there for the long run, particularly where they're changing land uses to ones where the main value is from um, carbon in nature. And this, in a sense, speaks to the politics of the uh, of the uh, agricultural transition. Again, England is, is moving faster than other, other parts of the UK, so I'll speak a bit about it. But we absolutely need to know that, um, that uh, the public money for public goods framework is there, it's durable, it's available over time because many farmers and land managers aren't thinking about kind of optimizing for the next two or three years, they're thinking about the next 50 and what it means for their children and all that kind of stuff. So there is a social guarantee that I think we need to be thinking about politically. Great, I think we better we better begin to wind up. Thanks very much, uh, Dustin, for an excellent talk and for dealing with all those questions that were coming from all directions on a, a, a wide range of issues um, provoked by your presentation. Um, Jez, do you think you could put our email addresses into the chat? I've, um, uh, I'm just going to suggest that if people um, have any comments on the webinar or would like to suggest speakers or topics that we should um, try and include in the webinar series in future, do feel free to, to, to get in touch with us. Um, can I thank you very much, Dustin, for your, for your talk, uh, which was excellent and very stimulating. That's been a great start to our series. Um, as I said, please let us know if you've got any uh, suggestions for, for future topics. And just a reminder that you can join our network. We've got over 430 members at the moment, um, but we plan to, to grow. And if you, if you haven't signed up through the website, feel free to sign up and um, you can hear about other activities and events as, the, as they come up. Um, but thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. I think we had over 90 people at the peak of attendance. And, and thanks again to Dustin for such a great talk. Thank you.